Greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, thank you for joining us today for this brief uh, ministry update about the important things taking place here at Hickson United Methodist Church. Well, we're in the throes of Holy Week, and we are excited to be able to offer multiple ways to celebrate and commemorate this particular time of the year. So on Thursday at 7 o'clock, we have our Maundy Thursday service, which will take place in the gym, where we'll celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion and have intentional time of prayer through prayer stations, personal prayer, where we can engage in that deep practice that's so important to our congregation to going to God and lift up the concerns of our hearts. The next day on Friday, we will remember and commemorate Good Friday at 7 o'clock here in the sanctuary where we will receive the gift of music through Fares Requiem. And we are just very excited to be able to offer both of those Holy Week services. On Easter Day, we're going to have some very special services together. We'll begin at 7 a.m. Uh, just outside the sanctuary, and then we will move inside and receive Holy Communion. The entire service will last about 30 minutes. Please come and join with us for that Easter sunrise service, and then our regular times of worship, 8.30, and then two services at 11. Invite your friends to come join with us as we celebrate Easter Day. And one of the ways that we're able to celebrate Easter together as a congregation is through the Easter Mission Offering, where we can uh, support God's work in our community and around the world. This year, our Easter Mission Offering is designated for three particular ministries that we already support, but want to go the extra mile to support this year. The first one is the UTC Wesley Foundation, a part of the campus of University of Tennessee, Chattanooga. And uh, the second one is Life Spring Community health which is also in the downtown Chattanooga area. And the third one is Henderson Settlement, a part of the Redbird Mission Annual Conference. And uh, we're actually anticipating on having a mission trip to that part of rural Appalachia to support that ministry there. So pray about how God is speaking to you to contribute and support those three ministries this Easter. These are exciting days, and the excitement continues on uh, Sunday, April 24, as we gather again in for one service of worship in the parking lot, and we're going to celebrate the risen living Lord Jesus Christ with a service of barbecue and bluegrass. And you can't beat bluegrass and barbecue. We're going to have a band come down from Nashville to lead our worship that day and to provide a concert following the service. And during that concert, we are having a meal catered by Off the Grill by Chef Q, which is right off Hickson Pike. So uh, come on down, invite your friends, invite your neighbors, everybody you know, so that we can have a fun time having bluegrass and barbecue right in the parking lot of our congregation. Friends, God is at work, and we are so grateful that that God's holy presence permeates through ministries and missions and opportunities of worship at Hickson United Methodist Church. Invite your friends, come and share in these important times. God bless you. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. My name is Josh Golden, Director of Music Ministries here at Hicks United Methodist Church, and we are so excited to welcome you to worship. Uh, if you are a visitor or you haven't been around in a, a long time or you have a prayer request, you'll find a card in front of you. We encourage you to fill out our welcome card and connection card and turn that in so that we can contact you and get to know you better. I do want to take just one more second to reinforce... Uh, the Good Friday service that's going to be happening in this space this week is my last chance. The last chance I'll see you uh, before that. And I think it's going to be an incredible night of music as the stage is filled with an orchestra and the choir loft is filled and we fill this space with the beautiful music of Fares Requiem. It's going to be a, a wonderful moment of worship. So I encourage you at 7 o'clock to come out for that as well as our Monday, Thursday service and of course to celebrate Easter morning with us here at Hicks United Methodist Church. As we begin our worship service this morning, I want to turn your attention to the bulletin and to the prayer verse that is at the bottom of the bulletin. We're going to begin our invocation by reading this verse, which many of you probably know by heart. We're going to read it out loud together. This is Psalm 118.24. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us pray. Father God, indeed, this is the day that you have made. And... 
We confess that sometimes we don't want to rejoice. We confess that sometimes our hearts are heavy, our minds are clouded, or we're just plain frustrated. We look around us and we see what's happening in the world. We look around us and we see what might be happening in our own lives. And rejoicing seems far away. Remind us, O God, as we go into this week, this week where things turn dark, this week where we commemorate and remember the ultimate sacrifice of your Son, remind us that even as your Son hung on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He gave you worship even in the last moments of his life. And so, Father, we can rejoice because we know you have made this day and we know you have made all days and we know you have made the future possible. So, God, I pray that this worship service would be fitting in your sight, that the words we say, the thoughts we have, the notes we sing would raise up and bring honor and glory to you, would bring your kingdom more upon this earth and would give us wisdom to live out our lives here in service to you. We ask all of these things in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us continue in that attitude of prayer as our acolyte brings forth the light of Christ. you received a palm branch as you came in. We're going to need those in a few minutes from everybody. And as we stand with our palm branches in our hand, let us stand for the reading of Mark chapter 11, the first 10 verses. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples to them saying, go to the village ahead of you. And just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Tell him, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered that Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they had brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches as they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Would you repeat after me? Hosanna in the highest. Again. Hosanna in the highest. Again. Hosanna in the highest. Let us now sing 
uh, our opening hymn, Hosanna, Loud Hosanna, together. conducted with a palm branch before. You may be seated. Thanks for uh, our children's ministry to be able to come and have the procession of the palms. And uh, I'm also want to say a word of thanks because I've been really impressed that none of you hit one another with these guys. Uh, I just knew that someone was going to be bludgeoned today with a palm branch, but you all have been very, 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 very uh, mature. So, well done. Well done, congregation. You're better than me. I was ready to smack somebody. Well, we are excited to be able to uh, lead into this Holy Week with Palm Passion Sunday. And today, as we enter into a time of congregational prayer, uh, this prayer includes a call and response. And it's different than ones that we've had in the past. This one, every time you hear the phrase, we trust in you, O Lord, as a congregation, we respond, you are our God. We trust in you, O Lord. You are our God. We trust in you, O Lord. You are our God. Let us pray. Lord God, our guide and our helper, open our ears that we may hear you as clearly as the prophets. Teach us to listen more intently to your word than we do to the sounds of the world. And when we hear, assist us in obedience and rejoicing, just like those who sang Hosanna at the gates of Jerusalem. We trust in you, O Lord. You are our God. Lord Jesus Christ, you emptied yourself for us. You set aside the glories of heaven and came to earth as the only Son of God. You were obedient unto death, even death on a cross. We confess today that you are our Lord in the glory of God the Father. We trust in you, O Lord. You are our God. Holy Spirit, just as you were with Christ at his trial, be with us in our trials, that we may not fear the forces of this world, but that we may stand in the confidence of of your comfort, the confidence of your leading, the confidence of your transformative work and power in our lives. We trust in you, O Lord. You are our God. And Lord, when we cry out in joy, receive our thanksgiving and praise, that it may be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. And when we cry out in despair, remind us to imitate our Savior, who said, your will, not mine and commit his spirit 
into your hands. We trust in you, O oh Lord. You are our God. On this Palm Passion Sunday, we celebrate with shouts of Hosanna, and we grieve with remembering your passion. That's life, is it not, O oh God? A combination and mixture of celebration and mourning. Today we commend to you all who celebrate and all who mourn this day regarding the circumstances in their lives. Give your grace to those who are in need. Remind us of the power of your spirit. Remind us of the strength of your mercy. Remind us that you too know the pains and suffering of death. And as one who knows that pain, you are the one who brings the healing that we need to press on. We trust in you, O oh Lord. You are our God. And now we join our voices together as we pray after the example of Christ in saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, if you are a child that would like to participate in our Growing in Faith ministry, you're welcome to meet a leader over at this side door at this time, though I think most of them are running around with palm branches at this time. Uh, that's an exciting day, exciting day. I also want to just say a word of thanks to you as a congregation for all the ways that you continue to make mission and ministry possible in this congregation. Uh, there are many ways that you can give to support the ministries here. You can give online at hicksonumc.org slash give. You can place a gift in one of the uh, offering boxes located around the sanctuary. You can also give by text to give by texting the amount that you would like to donate to the number on the screen, 423 406 Six four eight nine, and then follow those prompts. And as always, we like to lift up various ministries that you're able to make possible because of your generosity. And today, we want to lift up God's greenhouse. Now, that's a, our nursery ministry that happens just on the in the new children's wing. I say new lightly because it's always new until something else, right? We've been in it seven years now. I think that's right. Uh, but this ministry is just so important. It blesses so many families and children through volunteers and through the prayer. So what I'd like to do, what I'd like to do is uh, just take one moment and to pray over all of those who work in that ministry and all of the parents, families, and children who receive the grace of that ministry. Will you join me for a word of prayer? God, we thank you for this ministry that we can offer here at this church to help the littlest among us so clear in the Gospels that you love children, and uh, they have a special place in our heart here. And we pray that for all who work and volunteer down there in our nursery ministry, that you would empower them to be able to share your grace and truth with them. That as they nurture those children one hour a week during the worship services, or even during the Sunday school hour, that those little children would be able to experience your grace, that the parents of those children would know that they are in good hands for they seek to honor you with their own work. We thank you for being able to work through us to provide this ministry, and we pray your blessings upon it. We ask this all in the name of Christ. Amen. And we continue to give our thanks and praise to God, even as we stand together and sing doxology. service it's going to be just a little different than normal and I wanted to prepare us for that 
There's very little in Scripture that is as dramatic as the moments leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus. It almost plays out like a movie. And in fact, as we know, many movies have been made depicting these events. So today we thought, given the drama of the story and the drama of the week to come, we would set it off in a, a fashion that allows us to wrap our minds maybe a little differently around these events. And so you're going to hear scenes pulled directly from Scripture, but read by various characters of these moments leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus. First in the garden, then in the courtyard, and then, of course, finally as he is before Pontius Pilate being sentenced. And so I, I hope and pray that these moments will allow you to enter into your Holy Week with a little more worshipful and meaningful and meditative attitude. You will have a role in the third uh, Seen, and you'll see that as we get there. But for now, let us prepare our hearts and our minds as we hear uh, our wonderful readers who we are so glad that have joined us. Uh, Will Rao and Claire Kaiser and uh, Ward Merrill are going to read for us this story as we experience it, and then we'll hear Drew comment upon that. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for that event. In the Garden of Gethsemane. <clears throat> they went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I go pray. He took with him Peter and James and John, and he began to be distressed and agitated, and he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And Going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that, if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. He came then and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you keep awake just one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time, trial, the spirit being willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And once more he came and found them sleeping for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to say to him. He came then a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up and let us get going. My betrayer is at hand. Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. And with him there was a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. So when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Then they laid hands on him and arrested him. But one of those who stood near drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to them, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I am a common caramel? Day after day, I was with you in the temple teaching, and you didn't arrest me. <sighs> but let the scriptures be fulfilled. All of them deserted him and fled. A certain young man was following him, wearing nothing but a linen cloth. They caught hold of him, but he left the linen cloth and ran off naked.
how striking it must have been for the disciples there in the Garden of Gethsemane. For three years, for three years, the disciples had been following after Jesus, performing incredible ministries, seeing Jesus being this kind of indomitable, strong figure who seemed to have charge of every situation that he faced. If a person came to Jesus and was sick, Jesus would bring healing into their lives. If a person was possessed by a demon, Jesus would drive the demon out from that person. If he were cornered by the religious elite of the day, then he would be able to tell a parable and spin it back around on them so the pressure would be put on the religious elite, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and all of a sudden they would be the ones who were trying to figure out how to answer the question before them. Add to the fact that Jesus would be the one that guided these disciples. Where to go? Where to sleep? What to eat? Jesus was their rabbi, their teacher, but more than that, Jesus was their caretaker, their Lord, the one whom they had been following for three long years. And this man, Jesus, was in charge of everything. But in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus isn't telling clever parables to trick anyone. He's not casting demons out of people. Rather, what they see in Jesus in the garden on that day was a man full of suffering and of anguish as he went into prayer. He even says to his disciples, I am deeply grieved even unto death. And he falls on his face in praying to God because of the pain and the anguish that he is facing. Luke's gospel says that as he was praying, sweat came from his brow that looked as drops of blood. Now, some medical professionals have been able to diagnose and seen this very kind of thing, and it's called hematidrosis. And uh, if I said that wrong and you're a medical professional, come and see me after the service and correct me. But this condition is, takes place whenever you have deep despair or anguish in your body, so much so that the blood vessels near your sweat glands rupture, and the blood then enters into the glands and then comes forth from your body as sweat and blood mixed together. This is what Jesus was experiencing, this deep, deep pain and anguish about what was before him. And with such great anguish, that Jesus was experiencing, surely the disciples who were there in the garden with him would be able to hear him when he cried out in prayer, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Take this cup from me, not my will, but your will be done. And even if they couldn't hear Jesus whenever he was praying, you can imagine that the feeling was palpable in that area whenever he was praying in silence. Surely Jesus' weeping and tears associated with this deep anguish could be heard and felt by the disciples who were not that far away at all. If you're familiar with the size of the Garden of Gethsemane, it's only about 57 square yards. That's about two infilled uh, baseball diamonds put together and then cut down in about half. Not that big at all, so you know that they could have been an earshot of one who's praying with such anxiety and stress and anguish. Now these intense prayers of Jesus, they should have alarmed the disciples. It should have made them want to bring comfort to Jesus, to tend to him, or at very least, at very least, to be, a per to be people who would then stand firm in the request that he'd just given them a few moments earlier. Keep awake. But they couldn't. They couldn't keep their eyes open. They couldn't live into the request of their master. Maybe, maybe the turmoil that Jesus was going through was too much for them to bear and to witness. Perhaps the reason they slept is because they thought, well, if we just fall asleep, we'll wake up, and we won't have to deal with it. Now, oftentimes, that's how we deal with the pain in our lives, isn't it? We find some way to anesthetize ourselves, to numb ourselves from the pain and suffering and anguish that we face. Try to find some outlet to escape our reality, whether it's through using something or doing something or sometimes simply saying, I'm going to go to bed and hope that when my eyes wake up, it was all but a dream. We want to run away from these things. And I think the disciples were thinking, maybe I can just fall asleep. 
and all this anguish and suffering will go away. Or maybe, maybe the disciples just received a large Passover meal and having consumed a fair amount of food and wine, they just wanted to slumber and ignore it all. No matter, I believe what's happened here is the disciples have become very self-confident. With all those years of walking with Jesus and seeing him perform miracles before their eyes, feeding the 5,000, walking on water, and many other uh, accounts of healing and uh, casting out demons and the like, they had become fully confident that no bad things would happen to them. Whatever suffering Jesus may be facing, they didn't have to worry about it because he had it all under control. They would not experience any of these bad things. For this Jesus that they had been following is going to be the Messiah, the anointed one, the chosen one of Israel, to be king over all, overthrow the Roman Empire, and be the one to set them free. So they said, we're untouchable. And they went to sleep, a sleep of self-confidence. But while they're asleep, Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, the betrayer, comes into the garden with a small fleet of armed men. And the disciples wake up. When they wake up, it's just in time to see their master arrested. Their master, who seemed to be the one who had control of every situation, seemed to have lost control. This indomitable figure in Christ, the one who stood against the Pharisees and Sadducees, the one who gathered crowds from all over to be able to hear his teaching, the one who performed miracle after miracle, the one who always had an answer, the one who always had control. It seemed that he had lost it. That maybe their dream of Jesus being the one, the Messiah, the coming king to rule over Israel, was not true. Their dream had been dashed and had been crashing around them. Their confidence was shaken and stirred, but even more than that, it was removed. Now, I wonder if that's why that peculiar sentence or two at the end of this scene is included in the gospel, where it says there's a certain young man who loses his clothes and runs away naked. I've always wondered about that. Well, maybe, maybe it's because it represents the lives of the disciples and even our own that we've been stripped of our confidence and now we too run away, undignified, uncertain of the future. In the courtyard, <clears throat> they took Jesus to the high priest and all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes were assembled. Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he was sitting with the guards, warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many gave false testimony against him, but their testimony did not agree. Some stood up and gave false testimony against him saying we heard him say I will destroy this temple that is made with hands and in three days I will build another not made with hands but even on this point their testimony did not agree then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus have you no answer what is it that they testify against you but he was silent and he did not answer Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, Why do we still need witnesses? You've heard this blasphemy. What is your decision? All of them condemned him as deserving death. Some began to spit on him, to blindfold him, and to strike him, saying to him, Prophecy. The guards also took him over and beat him. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When he, she saw Peter warming himself, she stared at him and said, You also were with Jesus, the man from Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, 
I do not know or understand what you're talking about. And he went out into the courtyard, forecourt. Then the cock crowed, and the servant girl, on seeing him, began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again he denied it. Then, after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to curse, and he swore on oath. I do not know this man you are talking about. At that moment, the cock crowed for the second time. Then Peter remembered that Jesus had said to him, Before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and he wept. I invite you to remain in your seats as we sing together this hymn number 286, O Sacred Head Now Wounded. Let's sing the first and last verses. It's an uncomfortable role, but an important one, and you'll see your part on the screens as we hear this final scene as Jesus is before Pontius Pilate. The Crucifixion. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, You say so. Then the chief priests accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival, he used to release a prisoner for them, anyone for whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. Then he answered them. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. 
Pilate spoke to them again. Then what do you wish me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! Crucify him! Crucify him! So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole cohort. And they clothed him in a purple cloak. And after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him. And they began saluting him. Hail, King of the Jews. They struck his head with a reed, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. that scene doesn't make your blood boil a little bit, then you might need to read it again. This scene is a scene that's an epitome of injustice. It's like seeing someone berating a child out in public or kicking a dog or doing some other unjust action out in front of other people to be seen because it's just not fair that Jesus is given the death sentence. For what? For healing the sick? For feeding the hungry, for teaching that the kingdom of God, as revealed in the Old Testament, is as near as your hand. And if that's not enough, what's more, a man named Barabbas is set free. Now, Barabbas was a prisoner of notoriety in the land. You may have heard that he was uh, called a part of a bandit or a part of an insurrection where he actually is accused of murdering. There's conflicting opinions on exactly what his crime was, but everyone does agree, scholars and readers alike, agree that he was considered to be a no good, very bad man. It's also interesting to note that the name Barabbas means Barabbas, son of the father. In some of the ancient manuscripts, when they list his name, son of the father, Barabbas, begins it with Isus, or Jesus, Barabbas. Jesus, son of the Father. So here in this scene, we have this striking dichotomy. Two men standing before the court, both named Jesus, both considered to be sons of the Father, and both are on the precipice of receiving the death sentence. And it's here that the theology of the Gospels is presented in a high definition, widescreen, 4K, ultra HD, surround sound. And we, the readers, know that one of these Jesuses is blameless, and the other is the quintessential bad guy. Now, surely, the decision is clear. They can't condemn the one man because he taught a new radical way of thinking about the kingdom of God. Certainly, they can't condemn this one man over a known murderer in their presence. Surely, the one who raised the life of a little girl from her deathbed will be the one who goes free. Surely the one who fed thousands of hungry people when they had gathered together would be set free. The one who saved people from their demons, who healed them from their sickness, who brought dignity to those who were marginalized and oppressed, surely that will be the man who is set free. But the unexpected happens. The crowd chooses to kill Jesus of Nazareth. And Pontius Pilate is shocked. So he asked the crowd for clarification. There are two Jesuses, two people who were considered sons of the Father. Do you really mean this Jesus? What wrong has he done? Surely you mean Jesus Barabbas. But they shout all the more, Crucify him. What sense? What sense does it make that a crowd would choose 
that an innocent man shall perish in place of a confirmed murderer. It's an uncomfortable thing to consider. If you're anything like me, whenever you participated in our liturgy and you shouted crucify him, you kind of wish you didn't (laughs) say it. You didn't want to have to utter it and you started to look at your neighbor like, why would you say that? But is that not Christianity? Is it not our faith? None of us want the innocent Jesus to die. We don't want to shout, crucify him. Without his death, we have no life. Without his crucifixion, we have no salvation. We think it unfair that the murderous Barabbas is set free and the innocent Jesus gets the death sentence. But if you stop and you think about it, we are Barabbas, not murderers, but people who are deserving of punishment, people who are deserving of reprimand. We are the ones deserving to receive the sentencing. But Jesus goes ahead and he takes it. He takes the weight of the punishment. He bears our sin. He goes to be crucified and die that we might have life. Palm Passion Sunday, it's always interesting to me that we begin with the palm branches and we shout Hosanna. Hosanna, which means God save us, we pray. Save us, we pray. Hosanna. And we sing it louder and louder. God save us, we pray. And we're waiting for that answer to that prayer. And by the time we get to the end of the service, God indeed answers the prayer. Hosanna, God save us, we pray. And the answer is shouted by a crowd outside of Pilate's door. So our salvation is found when we shall crucify him.
Holy Week is often a heavy week. We want to rush straight to Easter Sunday. Easter morning is shout our hallelujahs. He is risen and he is risen indeed. As we recall the story of Jesus' passion. As we recall the story of God giving himself fully to experience all the pains that we have in this life. We are reminded. We are reminded that we have quite a journey ahead of us before we can then experience the fullness of what it means on Easter Sunday. We're ready to sing hallelujah. We want to talk about resurrection. But first, we have this final week to walk together and remember our Lord and Savior's passion. So, this week, go through the scriptures. Remember the passion that God has for you, that he would send his only begotten son, that we might believe and have the life that we all sing about next week. We're going to sing it a lot next week, but for now, but for now, let us remember his passion. I invite you now to stand to receive this blessing and benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he shine his face upon you. May you know that you indeed are loved and that you are a precious treasure to him. And as we walk through this holy week, may you do all that you can to love him and serve him just as he loves and serves you. In the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.